they'd be able to hear you a little bit better. So try to speak up if you can as you're uh, as we're walking through this thing together. Well, the lessons this week are are um, uh, the third in our series on uh, generosity and and um, uh, especially encouraging our own personal generosity and. And I'm going to focus in the sermon on uh, Proverbs 3 and the background to the whole idea of first fruits, uh, which is in the last uh, verse of that lesson. Um, so why don't we start just by reading it through and um, uh, read it through as it's printed this way. We'll read it on Sunday in our worship uh, responsibly. My son, don't forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. And trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then and your arms will be filled to overflowing, and your backs will bring over with new wine. Now this is um, a favorite verse of mine. Uh, uh, I always say one of my life verses is uh, verses uh, 5 and and six, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways, and he'll make your path straight. And um, that's the way I learned it, memorized it, and, and I carry that verse with me uh, regularly. But uh, just backing up, I, as I said, this is a good one to talk uh, about the generosity and the aspects of generosity, and we're gonna get at that. I don't have any questions on here about first fruits, so you have to pay attention on Sunday. Because um, we're going to uh, explore the background of that, of, of what um, Solomon's writing about when he's when he refers to uh, uh, the first fruits, um, and 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 how that concept can guide our own uh, generosity as we think about uh, what we uh, how we respond to God's grace. But one of the things that's interesting in this passage is that there's a whole series of promises or results. So let's just pause and take a minute to just reflect on what are the what are the positive results or promises that God gives uh, in and through His Word uh, in here. So just what are the results or promises, and, and let's just go through that. Uh, first one is long life. Long life and, and peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity you know, um, this morning I was just finishing. Uh, in John chapter 10 and 11 with the confirmation class, and that's where that passage is where G Jesus says, uh, came that they might have life and have it abundantly. And the point of that is that, um, that the relationship that we have with Jesus is not just to get us to heaven. Yes, that's one of the things, but it's also to enrich our life right here and now. And... Um, and so here he's repeating, obviously, a promise that in the Ten Commandments is connected to the, which commandment? It's first. Oh. No. Fourth. Fourth commandment. It's the first one with a promise. Honor your father and mother that you may, you may go well with you and you may live long on the earth. So, But here he applies it to all of the commands of God, not just to the fourth mm -hmm. commandment. Um, so he says, don't forget my teaching, keep my commands in your heart. Why? Because they'll prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. So there are blessings that come in our life when we listen to what God has to say. And um, uh, So does he say keep them in your heart specifically because he knows you're going to break them? Well, keeping them in your heart means they're going to guide you, right? And even though they guide you, you may step out of bounds once in a while, but you'll know you're out of bounds because you've got them in your heart and you're going to feel guilt and shame. And I think we talked about this last week. I would argue with Fred all the time that I was such a good person that past week and didn't break any of the commandments. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you heard that before, Mark. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, if they're in your heart, and how, really, how do you know when you step out of bounds? I mean, we'd argue back and forth. I, I honored God. I went to service on Sunday. I didn't covet my neighbor's wife. I didn't covet his man service. <laughs> None of that stuff. I didn't do a single thing. Didn't murder anybody. I didn't steal anything. That's why we pray the prayer that, you know, God, forgive us for what we know we did and forgive us for what the we, things what we, we did. Didn't, didn't know we did. And, and also to think more expansively of the commandments because that's what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount is he says, you know, you've heard it said, don't murder, but I tell you, anybody who's been angry with his brother from the heart, anybody who's called another person a fool, which Lord knows there's a lot of that going on in politics these days. <laughs> it often goes on on Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff too, you know. Um, but it, the point is, is that we, you can say that if you restrict what you think that commandment means. But when you listen to what God's word says and and he expands that, so even envy of any kind, saying I want and not being content with what you have, uh, becomes a sin. Bearing his name in vain uh, does not mean just, um, and, and Jewish commentators will say, that it does not just mean using the name of God in a wrong way. It means bearing his name, which is on you because he's placed his name on you, and any time you live outside of his will, then you're misusing his name. Any time you and I live outside of his will, any time then we're bearing his name, because everybody else knows that we're, well, hopefully they know we're Christians, we're followers of Jesus, followers of the way, followers of, um, of the Lord, and, and when we don't act like it, then we're bearing his name in vain. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, it's, it's that idea that if I have those commands in my heart, they're going to help me make good choices. But it doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect. Um, what about the next one? What's the next promise? Move in favor and a good name with God. Right, and you notice I didn't do this one so that you said the second half of the verse or the second thought. This is um, because this is one of those three-part verses. So there's the let love and faithfulness never leave you. Then the what does that look like? So this is the Hebrew <laughs> parallelism saying the same thing in a different way. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. And then comes the promise. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. They'll say... Well, that person's the kind of person I want to spend time with, be around. Um, I've had a number of couples use this passage um, for a wedding verse. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your heart, write them on the tablet. Uh, or bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Um, the next one is... Next promise that he gives us. We make our hands straight. As we submit to him, as we trust in him, and don't just uh, lean on our own understanding, um, he'll make our paths straight again. It's about guiding through life. The next one is? Health to your body. And nourishment to your bones. I always love the, um, the research that's been done um, in the medical field on things like the power of prayer, for instance. And I know there have been some studies where they've uh, had control groups. Um, I remember there was one with, I believe it was broken hips. And a certain number of people are prayed for and a certain number of people are not the control group. And the people who were prayed for got better, quicker, better, and, and faster. Um, even if they didn't know they were being prayed for, which was interesting. Because um, that was kind of a blind um, experiment, so the person, it's like a blind, uh, uh, a double blind uh, experiment with medication. They give the medication, but neither the person nor the person who's giving the medication knows whether it's the, the placebo or whether it's the real thing. 
And they do that because sometimes the person who's giving the medication can unintentionally, very subtly, um, let the person know that they're getting the real thing. So they can't let the person who's giving it also know whether it's the real thing or not because they don't want anything to uh, affect um, the uh, testing of the drug except the drug itself. So, uh, and, and that kind of thing has been done. Um, there have been books written by some doctors on prayer and its power and all that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing we do know is that people who are, um, who regularly, and, and, and we have to define this a little bit more, uh, people who are practicing their faith uh, have lower blood, blood pressure, less depression, all kinds of other things are associated with that. There's all kinds of studies that have been done um, to indicate the blessings that it brings physically uh, to our bodies. And, and so uh, that's his promise. And then the final one is? Going to be blessed um, materially. Going to be blessed materially. Your barns will be, so he's talking about first fruits of all your crops. Um, and uh, there'll be a, that, and Paul says it a different way in his letter when he says that God will um, provide you with everything you need as you resupply others. Um, and that's his, his promise. And new wine. <laughs> and new wine. I haven't mentioned that. <laughs> and new one. Um, so the second question is, how can you bind love and faithfulness to your heart with spiritual practices? Can you assist you with this? When he says bind, you, you, it's really easy to read that, but what do you do to bind the word to your heart? How do you bind God's love and faithfulness? In the word. I always think how important it was when I was growing up to memorize when we went to Kabbalah, went to the broken school that we had memorized. And I find that that is so important now because I have it in my heart and I have to remind myself. And sometimes when I'm with people, I can share a verse out of the Bible with no hesitation. Patient. Yeah, you know, the kids always say, well, we're never going to remember this. And I say, oh, yeah, you will. You'd be surprised. <laughs> You'd be surprised how much of it comes back. You know? I think it helps, Pastor, if, if you want to put this in your heart, <clears throat> to study, at least read a passage in the Bible every day. Nobody's saying you have to write a long journal entry or expound, but just start with a Bible passage a day. Sit down, get out of, get out of bed, sit down, open up your Bible, read a passage, Think about it and, and do a prayer in your dog. And I think that starts to work in you and you become closer. And it's fairly easy. We have the portals of prayer, right? Yeah, Our right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. Well, and I have the Bible app on my my tablet, and so I think I shared with you I do three brain drain games first thing in the morning. They're um, Spider Solitaire, um, uh, which other one? Oh, Monkey Wrench and uh, Seven Little Words. I do those three, and um, and I do the Seven Little Words and Monkey Wrench without any clues. Um, I try not to use any of the clues that they have and just be able to see the words and stuff like that. And then the very next thing I do is I hit the Bible app and it gives me a verse for the day. And, um, and, and it has nothing to do with getting ready for a sermon or a funeral or teaching a class or anything like that. It'll be a random verse. Mm -hmm. And um, and and usually I'll, I'll hit it so that rather than just reading the verse, I read the chapter that it's in. It really takes less than a mm -hmm. you know, minute or two, but it gives you just that little bit of food. And, and, and when, I, when I teach this, I would say, you know, God in his word compares his word to food very often. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, how often do you have to eat in order for your body to be physically healthy every day, right? And if that's true of physical food, isn't that true also of 
spiritual food that um, God wants and intends for us to be fed by his word uh, each and every day. So yeah, certainly reading the Bible. What other things can help that? And notice he says specifically love and faithfulness. So it's not just about knowing his word. <coughs> It's those encouragements that you get and that you give within the family of faith. You know, I was so, always so wonderful talking with my sister because we could just so freely share, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't preachy. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was. You know, and, and it um, brings to mind uh, trusting in the Lord with all your heart. That was my mother's favorite, favorite verse. And you just see how it formed her life. It was wonderful. Yeah, one of the things about thinking about this love and faithfulness is whose love and faithfulness is he talking about? Christ. Is it the love and faithfulness of God or is it the love and faithfulness that you share with us? And it works either way. Because God's love and faithfulness engenders in us love and faithfulness to uh, those that he has placed around us to, to love and be faithful to. If you think about the two tables of the law, loving God and loving his kids, um, love the Lord God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, then, um, yeah, those are, it can work both ways. Spiritual practices, um, love and faithfulness. You know, quite honestly, as a pastor, that's one of the reasons I do the five prayers every week. Because it forces me to call five people. Which would be really easy to ignore because I, I got plenty of other things I can do. Okay. Five, five prayers. The five so families we pray for every Sunday. Oh, okay. <laughs> The okay. five families we pray for every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And three church families, one school family, one child care family. Um, but that's a, that's a discipline that I've instituted to try to be faithful <laughs> in the shepherding of a flock. And it just helps me be disciplined in doing that. And, um, you know, so what spiritual practices can you have that uh, engender that kind of um, love and faithfulness in, in your life. There, there's been some research done um, also. Um, as soon as you wake up in the morning, you say three things that you're grateful for. Kind of sets your day. It um, changes your attitude. Yeah. Totally, because mind, body, and spirit, they say, it all goes together. Yeah. So you're starting with your mind, it goes to your soul, and then flows out through your spirit. I think that's a cool way. Mm -hmm. That's a great spiritual practice to start every morning with. Thanks, and that's been pro proven in secular studies. So. Um, and that the effect, even after they finished the experiment, lasted uh, six months later on the fam on, on the people who had started, maybe part of it is they probably kept it up a little bit or it set them in a different frame of mind. Mm -hmm. But after the experiment was done, then they went back and they, they uh, re-interviewed the same people six months later and found still this, a residual effect in the people who had just practiced that simple thing. Before they, their feet hit the floor, they they named um, uh, things that they were thankful for. And then um, probably the challenge in this passage is the constant um, encouragement to submit to God. Um, so lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways submit to him. And, and so just kind of as a personal reflection you can take from this verse is just to ask yourself, what in my life do I need to bring in submission to Jesus? Is there some part that I'm hanging on to? And, um, and maybe think I've been listening to a little bit of Tim Keller's teaching and, and uh, 
on the radio as I'm driving, and uh, uh, he just shared this one when it came to anxiety and worry. He's a big fan of Martin Luther, and uh, he said uh, uh, that in Luther's experience, Philip Melanchthon, who helped to write many of the confessions, was kind of Luther's right-hand man. He was a layman, but a, a very expert writer. Um, he was a worrier. And he said when he was in a time of great anxiety, uh, Luther would come up and put his hand on him and say, there, there, um, uh, Philip, it's time to get off the throne. <laughs> time to get off the throne, you know. Um, time to let God be in control. And I, I thought that's just a, I can see Luther doing something. Yeah. <coughs> Of course, that brought to mind the time when Katie dressed up in mourning clothes and was walking around, and he's like, well, who died? And she said, well, you must have because of the way you're acting. Because <laughs> <laughs> she was tweaking him a little bit because he was in a uh, apparently not such good mood. So she dressed up, dressed up in her funeral clothes to drive the point home. All right. So just a quick reflection on that one. Colossians 2 is, is one of the places where it talks about um, overflow, which is kind of in uh, our, our kind of theme is that we, we start with what God gives us and it overflows from our lives into the lives of others. So why don't you read that one with me? I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So that just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. My three questions have just to do with that last part. Uh, Paul's rejoicing with the Colossians uh, in their faith and in their life, and, um, and then he uses these three phrases that I think are good kind of self-reflection phrases about our own lives. How are you continuing to seek, sink your roots deep into Jesus? He said, he says, rooted, rooted in him. And that has to do with the foundation of our, of our trust and our faith. And so to be rooted in him, what do we do to get rooted in him? Read the Bible, go to Bible classes, <laughs> go to church, prayer, prayer. You're receiving nourishment from a deep source. Living in your baptism, knowing that God called you to be his Child. daughter or son, mm -hmm. uh, named you as one of his own, placed his name on you, and communicated to you the promises connected with that water and word. And, uh, and so uh, remembering those promises is uh, a great help to, to the rooting that we do. Um, what about the built up and strengthened part? So once you're rooted. I, I many times tell my children, and I have to remind myself that too, is that to stand firm. So I think I, I oftentimes talk about the roots that they've had since their baptism and stuff, and that they're rooted. And with everything going on in the world, they get swayed back and forth by all these different ideas, and then they question, or they say, 
I think God this and I think God that. I'm like, well, you can't make God how you want him to mm -hmm. be. You have to go back to your roots and then stand firm on it. And I, I think it's something I have to remind myself sometimes too. And it's basically you have roots. You have to stand firm. You really have to dig deep. So part of it is standing firm in the face of opposition or a challenge that would sway us from where we're. I kind of just know that you know that you know that God's got you, you know. And you know, it's, I'm, as I'm looking at the study today, it's interesting to me that being tr trusting in the Lord, which is giving up, giving up your earthly feelings and thinking, may, you know, fosters when you give something up, you give something back. It doesn't make sense, but it, but it happens. You really. Once you let go and let the Lord lead your life, you get that feeling of security. And when you feel secure, you're so thankful for that that it promotes you to give. And I just think that's remarkable. Yeah, Karen. Well, and when, when you talk about your roots, your roots can be good, but if they're not fed and watered right. and given nutrients, they'll dry up and and die. So all the things we've talked about, the Bible, Bible study, reading the word, praying, all that stuff is good, but then as Deb was just saying, you have to give up yourself to keep, and that makes you feel better mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. to help someone else when you might need help sure. sometime yourself. Sure. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a whole cycle of things. Modeling, like modeling after Jesus. Really? Well, and I think of the L.W. Mills, <laughs> serve the Lord with gladness. I mean, you know, you have to um, give of yourself to get back. Something. I know that sounds weird, but I may not be saying it right. No, but no. It well, but you're absolutely weird. right. It does, it, it does sound weird. Sometimes stepping out and serving somebody else um, fills the hole that's inside you that you didn't know was there. And it feeds you. And it feeds yeah. you and encourages mm -hmm. you. It's interesting that this is, when he says so then, it's related to what's above, and, and you notice that he says his goal is that they would be encouraged in heart and united in love, and he's talking about people that he knew and people that he had never met personally, but, but he's praying uh, for them, and Laodicea is a town that's very close to uh, uh, Colossians, uh, Colossae, and so He's praying for both of these congregations that they might have this encouragement both in heart but the unity and love of the of the brothers and sisters um, and the other thing that he points to I think is is um, uh, when we think about being strengthened uh, a phrase that goes with that from above is that they may have the full riches of complete understanding so um, you know, the scriptures have famously been uh, described as a stream that's so shallow the smallest infant can crawl across it and so deep the wisest man can drown in it. Uh, and and the, the idea is this, that the, the, the basic principles of, of life in Jesus are pretty simple, you know? We're sinners. We're created by God. Something's gone wrong. We're sinners. We're broken people who live in a broken world. Um, and uh, for that reason, God <coughs> sent his son Jesus into this world to live a perfect life in our place, to die an innocent death in our place, and arise to give us assurance of hope. And one day he's going to fix this whole world. And uh, the whole world will be renewed, including us. I mean, it doesn't take long to summarize Christian faith. But that's not all there is, right? It's the complete understanding and, and the riches uh, that, as we saw back in Proverbs, when we're carrying God's word in his heart, it helps our daily living as well as, 
you know, looking forward to that time when he's going to take us home to help heaven. What does it help us with? Well, it helps us deal with worry and anxiety. It helps us understand um, where our true citizenship is. It gives us hope and comfort as uh, we're going to share with uh, families tomorrow when somebody dies that that it's perfectly okay to cry. Jesus cried at a funeral, you know, but uh, but always with that hope that what Jesus did for Lazarus, he's going to do for us as well. It's called us back from death to life. And and uh, and it, it gives us a different view of how we look at our employment so that, you know, as Paul says in another place, we don't live, we don't work only when our boss is watching us. But we work wholeheartedly as for the Lord, you know. Um, it changes the way that employers look at their employees, that they're uh, to treat them fairly and kindly and, and, um, and to make provision for them and to look out for them. That's all a part of what it means to walk in this thing we call the, the Christian faith or the, or, or the way. It affects our, our relationships. It, it um, encourages us to be on the lookout for people that we can serve. Um, having our, our senses uh, um, raised so that when somebody comes across that needs uh, love and service and we have the capacity to give it, we're able to step in and do that. Not just say, well, that's not my business. You know? uh, to Cain's question, am I my brother's keeper, we give a whole different answer than he did. Part of that. You know, um, I mean, yeah, I think ahead. the part about being strengthened is having, um, say, some opportunity presented to you and maybe thinking, oh, I, I don't think I can do that. But doing it and realizing, oh, I, it was a good thing. I'm glad that I did it. It helped somebody or whatever. But I think that if you don't use a muscle, it goes. And sometimes you don't know until you... Try it, right? Um, uh, you know, you, you you just don't know until you until you try. When I had uh, the funeral of, of, of a week ago, about uh, with uh, Fred Eggles from Emmanuel and uh, somebody we know for many years, I remember a training that I went to that Fred was at because he was very involved in the evangelism program out at St. Peter. Pastor Sheck was there, and, and they were doing a training, and I can't remember where I was. I think it was even before I was here, and I came down. He was one of the trainers, but I didn't get him. I got another guy, and the other guy we got was a plumber, who then we went around and knocked on doors of people who had visited or they had some kind of contact with St. Peter, um, and it was like a follow-up visit, and, and uh, I remember driving in the car with this plumber, and uh, and, and I remember after we were all done, he, he wasn't a real polished speaker, you know, and uh, after we were all done and we were debriefing back at St. Peter, he, he said, you know, guys, he said, I didn't make my living with this, he pointed to his mouth. He said, I made my living with these. And in fact, in my business, uh, I wasn't very good at you know, the sales pitch and all that kind of stuff. I was good enough that I made a really, really good living. Um, but I was good with my hands. And he said, when, when they first asked me to consider, you know, doing the kind of calling that he's now training us, some of us who are pastor, pastors how to do, um, he said, I said, oh, there's no way. But um, finally somebody who knew me said, I think you might do that and encourage me. And so I went and... and uh, he said, you know, it's really funny. He said, I have such a hard time talking sometimes to other people. But when I talk about Jesus, everything just comes out. And to your point, Judy, he said, I never would have done that if somebody hadn't really just said, well, let's just go try. <laughs> and, and, and he'd been doing this then for a number of years. In fact, he had told us that he's semi-retired. Um, so he was still doing some plumbing work, you know, but he was, uh, he semi-retired partly so that he could go out during the day because sometimes the people that they visited were second or third shift uh, 
busy with people, but especially second shift um, people, and, and the best time to catch them was in the morning, and he couldn't do that, obviously, if he was working all day. So he semi-retired purposely <laughs> so that he could do this. Uh, something he had thought, there's no way I would ever be able to do. Um, so yeah, taking a step in faith, um, being strengthened in that way. Okay. Any, any other reflections on this particular passage? Then? And then the, the last one is, where and how is your life overflowing with thankfulness? How is it overflowing with thankfulness? In the midst of this pandemic, and when the, the terrible experiences of nurses and patients in the hospital, and people who have lost their jobs because of it and are in grave need and so on. How can you not say, thank you, Lord, for my circumstances? You know, the contrast is so great. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, it really drives you to your knees. Yeah, right. Said the jury, I said it's really sad because now is the time when you could really use it, but you can't do it. There are a lot of people who can't go home for, mm -hmm. and I'd love to have some of them come in and share Thanksgiving with us, but I can't do it either because of the people that I see. Um, I have to be very, very careful. Um, uh, but it's sad because there's going to be a lot of people who are lonely. You know, who, there's kids who can't come back from college or seminary. Because they're saying if you come, if you go home, then when you come back, you got to quarantine for two weeks, whether you got any symptoms or not. Right. You're going to have to quarantine, and, mm -hmm. and so most uh, colleges and universities are saying you can't come come home. Uh, yeah, it's it's a real challenging time. So how do we overflow with thankfulness when we're somewhat restricted in how we do that? Now, I'm not just talking about money. It might mean picking up the phone and calling somebody that you know that's going to be alone in a way that they aren't typically alone through the holidays. Uh, Rend of acts of kindness. Paying for someone's groceries that's in the lot ahead of you. Let's just start with them. Anything to, to lift the spirits of other people. If, if, as we are blessed to be able to do something like that for another person who uh, maybe needs a little bit of encouragement. So just, just thinking about letting the life that God has given you overflow in, into others. Well, let's spend a little time then on the gospel. The gospel is John chapter 4. It's one of my favorites, and I just got another Bible study that I've done on the gospel of John. And we'll think a little bit through this one and, and, and how it fits into this theme of overflowing. Um, so somebody want to start reading the, from the first verse there in the gospel of John as, as long as you care to? Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. So may I pick up? When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samar Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, 
you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So the setting is this, Jesus has been down in Jerusalem, Judea, and one of the things that John focuses on in his gospel is the developing plot of the uh, Jewish leaders to kill Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's why at the very beginning it says, now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining more disciples. He knew that wasn't going to sit well with them, so he had to get out of town. So he leaves Jerusalem, which is just to the north and uh, uh, west of the Dead Sea. That probably should be a little bit bigger. And uh, he goes up to Galilee, which is this region by the Sea of Galilee, and he passes uh, the town called Sychar. Um, and this is where he meets this woman at the, at the well. Now it said he, he had to go through Samaria, and just to kind of think a little bit about the context, um, there's these two questions. Have you ever been warned that you should avoid certain people? Who are they under what circumstances? Why have you been warned to avoid them? Bear fans. <laughs> <laughs> or Cubs fans if it's baseball. Or Vikings. <laughs> yeah, what other kind of people are you warned to avoid? Maybe growing up or strangers. Strangers would be one, right? Stranger danger. Native Americans, and that came from my grandma. Huh. Because if you walked along the road at Shawano Lake by yourself as a child, the Indians would come and scoop you up and your family would never see you again. Huh. <laughs> that scared me. That was the idea. That was the idea. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so stay, yeah, sometimes it's racially connected, right? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's a class of people. Um, I don't know whether you call strangers a class of people, but that's a definable group, right? <laughs> I was saying my dad, and this is terrible really when I think about it, but uh, when I was, you know, driving around on my own and stuff, he always said, if you go downtown and you get lost, don't go down streets that are named after fruits or nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, I mean, seriously, don't go down streets that are named. So, like Cherry, Walnut. Cherry Street, Walnut, Walnut Street. <laughs> That's true. But, you know, it served me well because one time I was going downtown to meet a friend at the Water Street Brewery, and I really didn't know. I, I was one of those people where if you can take left or right, I always put the wrong side. There's only two choices, and I always went the wrong way. And they said, if you get over the bridge, you know, you, you've got to get back the heck out of, on the other side, you know. And, he, and then, of course, I was on the other side, and there was just a, and there was an African-American guy jogging, and I was just like, I, I guess I didn't ever really quite understand the concept. And I'm like, do you know how I can <laughs> And he gave me directions, and yeah. fine. But I, I just, that always makes me think, and yeah. kids know, know that grandpa said that, too, because well, part of that is just to realize that, that the Samaritans were people that Jews avoided, and Jews were people that Samaritans avoided. Um, and then the other thing was places. Did you ever go to places, or were warned about places, uh, the streets that were named after fruits and nuts? <laughs> what other kind of places have you been warned about? I walked, I was in Detroit, I walked into a grocery store and I was the only white person in the store and they had an armed guard standing there and I just walked in and he said, oh man, you're in the wrong store, please turn around and I gotta go somewhere else. And I was like, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he warned you. 
Yeah, sometimes uh, when I think about people, I think as a kid, sometimes your parents might say, well, I don't want you hanging out with right. so-and-so. Because that was one thing that happened. Not that my parents warned me, but um, that making friends with people of other religions. Oh. Mm -hmm. I do remember a really uh, dear friend, Kathy Link, and I confessed to each other at one time that we were very sad that the other one of us was going to hell. <laughs> she was a Catholic and I was a Muslim. <laughs> and you're both Christians. We so. were both feeling really bad that this was going to happen because we were such good friends. Uh, so it's, it's just this um, um, sometimes prejudicial, sometimes uh, it's about caution and fear, and, and sometimes it can be very practical. Um, so when I was... Um, uh, the pastor here uh, the first time, and Jean Harder had a station down here um, on Santa Monica and Hampton, yes. I think it is, mm -hmm. and uh, he kept a lot of Lutherans uh, cars going, mm -hmm. and um, we took uh, one of our cars down there for him to work on, and I think it was one of the very first times that I said, well, Jesus. I knew where he lived, and I said, well, you have a straight shot if you just get on Hampton to go, you know, west, and well, he said, I never go on Hampton. <laughs> right. I said, well, how do you go? He said, well, I'll sometimes take Silver Spring, but usually I go up to Good Hope, and I know where he lives in the falls, and he's just north of Good Hope, so you know, that can make sense. I said, well, why wouldn't you take you know, Hampton or, or Silver Spring? He said, too many uninsured drivers. Yeah. Yeah. I had never thought about that. <laughs> no, but he said, too many uninsured drivers. He said, that's why I go up to Good Hope. I'm like, more likely, if I get in an accident, that the person who's in the accident with me is going to have insurance and otherwise my company pays and I think he had had an accident where somebody was uninsured and that's what sparked that whole thing but you know so there could be very practical reasons not really prejudicial just you know kind of looking out for mm -hmm. taking care of um, financially so how would it how would a Jew normally go from Jerusalem to Galilee They would cross here, go up here, cross back. They avoided Samaria. So a typical Jew would come this way, go out of their way to not have to go through Samaria. So that's the first thing we find really surprising in John 4 is Jesus doesn't, he doesn't follow the typical path. Now he doesn't go to good hope. <laughs> right? He takes Hampton. <laughs> And, um, and that means he's got to pass through this, uh, this uh, town called uh, Sychar. Um, why do Jews normally avoid Samaritans? And there's, um, uh, there's, it says that in our text, you know, John, he's writing you this is one of the reasons why you know John is not writing for a Jewish audience, because he has to explain. He wouldn't have to explain this, but in the parentheses for Jews do not associate with Samaritans, he has to let people know that, that he's writing to, because if they don't know the typical Jewish Samaritan kind of uh, experience. So why, why would it be surprising? Uh, well, why would, would uh, they be surprised that Jesus was identifying with Samaritan? If you've got a study Bible, there's notes in there that would help you with this. But, what are, what are a couple of reasons? The, there was such animosity between the two groups of people. The Samaritans were what was left over after one of the conquering uh, people from the East had carried off the best. They carried off the smartest people, the most handsome, the best physically fit, and what they left behind were what was regarded by the Jews as half-breeds. Well, the, the ones who left behind, off, many of them intermarried. Mm -hmm. With them. And so they were considered half-breeds. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, because uh, in the Babylonian captivity, that's exactly what they did. They took all the doctors, the lawyers, anybody who showed promise. And we see that in stories like uh, in the book of Daniel the way Daniel was treated, the way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were treated. You know, they were given uh, positions of power. 
this is again something that we, it's very difficult for us. I'm reading a book right now about um, the Roman um, li living at the time of Jesus in Rome. And so it starts with these two characters and one of them was a slave but his master in freedom, and then he became a businessman who did business with the master who was his former owner. Because that often happened in Rome, it's, it, and so slavery in the first century <coughs> in biblical times was not, is not equivalent to slavery in the South in America. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why when people react about how the Bible speaks about slavery, they've got you know, the context of the way slaves were treated in the South and how they were acquired and all that kind of stuff. Rather than understanding that in first century times, slavery was often uh, their way of dealing with bankruptcy. That you got into debt to somebody and how did you became their slave until you paid them off? If you were so far in debt that you couldn't pay them off. That was their way of dealing with bankruptcy. Uh, they didn't have, there was no court, bankruptcy court to go to where they're going to say, well, you only have to pay 50 cents of every dollar you owe or whatever, you know, and we're going to clear the books and now you can't borrow money for, what, it's seven years, I think, if, you're, if you declare bankruptcy in the United States. So, so it's this kind of, uh, of situation. That's one reason. They're considered half-breeds. They were the people who left behind intermarried with uh, uh, Palestinians, and so they were no longer pure bloods. Um, anybody who knows the Harry Potter story, you know that there are pure bloods and mud bloods, they're called. The mud bloods are the mixed race. They have a, uh, uh, a wizard parent and, a, and a, what they call a muggle, uh, a regular human being parent. And, and it's that same kind of animosity. That's one reason. What's another reason? Well, the Samaritans probably were eating pork and everything else that the Jews didn't like and well, that would make them unclean. They, they didn't because the Samaritans um, accepted the first five books of the Bible as scripture. And so they had a biblical basis. And the difference is, is that they worshipped at Mount Gerizim up here rather than in Jerusalem. And she addresses that a little bit later on. So their worship practices, though, are different. Um, and their belief system, therefore, are different because uh, uh, they accepted only those books in the Bible. Um, why were the disciples, next question, surprised that Jesus would talk to a Samaritan woman? That's the male-female thing. Now we got the male-female thing. You, you don't. In this culture, you don't talk to a woman to whom you've not been properly introduced. Um, it, it's just something you don't do. I remember somebody from Brookfield Lutheran, they were doing ESL classes, and he said this with um, somebody from uh, the Middle East that they had been doing ESL classes with, and, and um, he said, it's, it, so this gal had been coming to the ESL class and he had been teaching her. And, um, uh, and then one weekend he was out shopping at Home Depot and she, he saw her and she was with her husband and he was like, well, hi, and she wouldn't even acknowledge him. And he didn't understand that he was breaking that same cultural barrier um, because in public he should not have addressed her without having been properly, because her husband didn't know him. I mean, she, he knew she was going to see at ESL classes, but did not know him. And so some of that still exists in some places uh, uh, today. So uh, to be talking to a Samaritan, what's more to be talking to a, a, a woman? Um, one of the neat things you'll find in the book of John is that there's this gradual recognition of who Jesus is. So. Um, you can track it through these verses. I'm so sorry to interrupt you.
can't be over tomorrow. All right, so let's just look at those. So if you've got your Bibles, you'll, you'll need to open them because they're not all here. Now you see the first couple here. What does she call him in verse 9? A Jew. You think in her mouth that was a good thing? Not if she was a Samaritan. So the first thing she calls him is a Jew. Then in verse 11 she calls him Sir. Sir. Now all of a sudden she's speaking with a certain tone of Amen. respect. Right? In verse 19, if you're there, what does she call him in verse 19? A prophet. A prophet. Now she, she, he's a step up above a human being, a regular run-of-the-mill human being, and now he's a prophet. And then finally in verse 29, he's called the Christ. Christ. Boy, that Messiah. was fast. Pardon? <clears throat> that was fast. Well, um, was. obviously this happened over the time of the conversation. Uh, yeah. And what we don't know is exactly how that conversation what, does John only give us a summary of the conversation, or does he tell us the whole thing? Um, we don't know. He would have had to have the conversation related to him from somebody, because remember, he wasn't there. He had gone with the other disciples off the town, so either he heard this from the woman, or he heard it from Jesus, uh, but he shares that conversation. And, and you will find that same thing in a number of places in um, chapter 9. There's the man who is uh, healed, who had been uh, paralytic for 38 years. And uh, if you remember that story, you remember that uh, Jesus comes and tells him how long, he, he said, fool, he says, how long you been here, 38 years, you know? No, do I have the right chapter? There's the man born blind, that's chapter, okay, I should just look, make sure I, Cite the right one. Now, chapter 5 is the healing of the pool. Man born blind is chapter 9. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, again, you've got this guy who really doesn't know who Jesus is. And in verse 7 of chapter 5, he calls him Sir. But later on, he comes to recognize that he is. The Messiah. The same thing happens in chapter 9 with the man born blind. The man born blind um, gets healed. Jesus says uh, uh, he puts some spittle mud on his eyes and says go wash in the pool of Siloam. The guy does it and when they come looking for him they say who is he? In verse 11 of chapter 9 it's the man Jesus. They call Jesus. Put some mud on my eyes and maybe go wash. You know? And then when he gets into, uh, then the, the Pharisees haul him in, and uh, they ask him, um, is he from God or not? And the man tells, uh, says in verse 17, he's a prophet. And uh, then at the end of uh, the, the account, uh, Jesus uh, this is in verse 35, heard that they had thrown him out of the temple, and when he found him, said, Do you believe in the Son of Man, a messianic title? Who is he, sir? The man asked, Tell me so I may believe in him. <laughs> and Jesus says, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. In other words, he's saying, I am him. The guy didn't even know that yet. Um, but you see this kind of um, pattern in the Gospel of John that it's not like somebody goes from nothing to some to a believer like that. It's a gradual process as the relationship develops. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, well, word was circulating around Judea that the disciples were baptizing more people. And 
Jesus took off and said, you know, I better get out of here or whatever. I mean, did the Samaritans, were they already aware that their Christ was on earth, that she would have been able to recognize that he might be the Christ? Well, there's there's no uh, news agency, no television, yeah. so... Just... They, they certainly had the expectation, the same expectation that the Messiah, the Christ, would be coming. So, because they still had that Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in your seed all the nations will be blessed, all of that, uh, that promise from the Old Testament. So they were actually watching and thinking it was going to, I mean, because I think yeah. now people, some of the Jews still think that hasn't happened yet. So. Right, and. And then remember, Jesus ended up, this isn't in the text that we have here, but he ends up staying three days there and uh, says to them, um, uh, uh, they, they say about him, they say, well, first we believed on account of the woman, but now we believe because we ourselves have heard you in person. So um, they become convinced that he is the Christ because of the and we don't have any of that teaching. Whatever he said over those three days, we have no clue. Uh, we just know he spent, they invited him to stay for a few days, and he stayed for three days, and then moved on. Yeah, Karen. Uh, do we know how close in time this was to his crucifixion? Well, this is, um, this is fairly early on in his ministry. The reason I was wondering is because if it was such a big deal that Jews didn't go through Samaria, how come the disciples weren't arguing with him about that because they argued with him about all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and at least uh, John's not saying it here then, but I can't imagine that they wouldn't have said, can't Are you go kidding? What's way? wrong with you, Jesus? Why are we going another way? Why are we going through here? And then yeah. they went into town to get food on top of it. I mean, I just, yeah, we're not taking that seems unusual to me. So I thought maybe they had to the come room. around a little bit. They weren't arguing so much. So, yeah, no, I... <laughs> It, it doesn't tell us, again, the Bible doesn't tell us everything we want to know. It only tells us what we need to know. It's not an encyclopedia. It's more like an owner's manual. I know. I can't help it. Inquiry. I know. Want to know. <laughs> well, but I, I actually I encourage people to do that. Put yourself in the, you know, could there have been that conversation where the Jews said, come on, Jesus, what do you think? Of, we don't want to go through there. Let's go the way everybody else goes or the way we would normally go. Um, or did they just, by this time, because they'd seen him change water into wine, <laughs> you know? Um, are, they, are they at this point, although this is before some of the other miracles that are recorded, we do know that he did some healing because it mentions it generally before this um, without specifics, uh, but uh, did they just say, well, he's the master, we're going to go wherever he takes us. I mean, where are they at that stage? But like you said, other places are not afraid to <laughs> argue with them a little bit, yeah. So, um, so just notice that there's this gradual, uh, uh, moving on, the, the three promises Jesus gives concerning <laughs> living water. Um, and those are found in verses 10 and 14. So what is a promise? that Jesus gives about this living water. He will give it. You will not be thirsty again. If you ask, he's going to give it to, give it to you. The second one is, yeah, you'll not be thirsty again. In other words, it'll be satisfying, fulfilling. You won't need, you won't be looking for something else. And the third thing is, Life. It becomes a, a spring that, a spring of water within them. Now, I want you just to think about that image a little bit. It's a spring of water that is within them. And this is one of the reasons also why I drew the, uh, the brief sketchy map. On the, when Jesus talks about giving them living water, and that's, that's the, the phrase. What is living water referred to? What's the difference between living water and dead water? 
It's being refreshed constantly, and it's coming of its own volition. It's not something you're going and scooping up. <coughs> it's coming to you. It's being refreshed, and a great illustration of that is these two seeds. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Because the Sea of Galilee is constantly being fed by tributaries that come down from the mountains. And the water flows in and flows through into the Jordan River, flows down to the Dead Sea, but it's called the Dead Sea because no there's no outlet. And therefore, life here is abundant. Life here is sparse. There is life in the Dead Sea, even though it's called the Dead Sea. But there aren't a lot of fish because it's not conducive to fish. The other thing you know about living water is besides being resupplied with water, what does the resupply of water also provide to the water that's there? Oxygen. Oxygen. What do fish need to live? Oxygen. Oxygen. So somehow, you, so that's why when you have a fish tank at home, you've got to have a aerator in there that's constantly providing oxygen to that water because sooner or later that just just like in a, an enclosed space, yeah, oxygen can be depleted and if oxygen is depleted, you've got to have supply from someplace else. The same thing is true in water. Eventually that water gets depleted and uh, the oxygen in the water gets depleted and has to be resupplied. Well, it makes me think about in the Garden of Eden at that time when God walked with Adam and Eve, the water I understood was, I mean all the, the foliage and everything was watered from underneath. Like they didn't have to go watering, there wasn't rain, it was just the nourishment was continual. Yeah, well there's a couple of thoughts about the world, so I'll give you another alternative one that I've seen. Um, and that is, if you think about the earth when it was created, it talks about the waters below the earth and the waters above the earth. It talks about this. So this is a possibility that somebody, some folks have suggested that at the time that the earth was created, there was actually more land than there is now. Um, that the water uh, on the earth and, and that was fed from the ground was one source of water, but the other source of water would have been, it would have been much more humid. Think of a greenhouse that's enclosed. On top of that, what happens when water passes through, um, I mean, when sunlight passes through water, what happens to the light? It's refracted, which means it bends, right? So if you're at the beach, You've done this maybe as a kid, and you stuck your hand in the water, it looks like your arms broke, right? Because it goes this way, and then it, and you know your arm's straight, but it looks like, because the light waves get bent when it hits the, the water. So what that would have meant is that you would have had more refraction, uh, instead of direct sunlight, it would have been a hazy sunlight, and uh, it also would explain where maybe some of the water from the flood came from, why it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Because it may be that this dissipated. It's just a theory that uh, some someone with a sign bad factor. Because this is a question I ask when people say, well, you know, how do you know the Bible's true? Well, I say, I don't know. I can't prove that it's true. Um, but maybe you don't know everything you think you know either. So tell me, where are the greatest oil reserves in the of the earth where are the greatest oil reserves in the face of this earth middle middle east middle east which is what kind of topography desert it's desert now what do you know about oil it's called a what kind of fuel fossil, fossil fuel. fuel it's what does it come from carbon from dead plants and animals so if some of the greatest reserves of oil are under deserts, under the Arctic Ocean, you know? Hence, we always have this battle between the Democrats and the Republicans about whether you should be able to. <laughs> they know the oil's there. There's nobody arguing about whether the oil is there. It's just whether we should do it in that, or pumping it out of places like the Gulf of Mexico. Um, one of the greatest um, oil reserves, uh, uh, 
is uh, in Siberia. That's where Russia gets a lot of their oil from. And you think, well, that's pretty uninhabitable for plants and animals. So where did all of that oil come from? You know, well, this kind of thing would explain a little bit of that, that it's more diverse and dispersed if, you know, and then you've got all those things like the lost city of Atlantis and all of those kind of things. So, um, and they do have, um, Alexandria, for instance, has a portion of it uh, in Egypt that's underwater, you know, that the water levels came up. So, who knows? But we digress a little bit. But yes, when we're, when we're thinking uh, about this living water, it's water that has to be refreshed to provide. Now, what is the living water Jesus is talking about? And it doesn't tell us in this text, but it tells us in John chapter 7. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. On the last and greatest day of the feast, um, he says, uh, this is um, John chapter 7, the last and greatest day of the feast, uh, verse 37. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And there we have the explanatory note um, of the author. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And, 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 and the point is that this is why I have it uh, for the gospel lesson for this Sunday, because it's about overflow. God gives us his Spirit, so if we're like the Sea of Galilee, not like the yeah. Dead Sea. It's not just supposed to stay bottled up in us, this living water but rather spill out of our lives into the lives of others as he gives us opportunity to love and serve and, 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 and be an encouragement to others. So, um, so that, that's one way to think about this. And then um, I'll just jump because we're uh, pretty much out of time. Uh, the last question is who might be the Samaritans in our world, people with whom decent people have nothing to do, and how can you treat them as Jesus treated the woman at Second. Or another way to think about it, and this is the way I always encourage our, our, us as a congregation to think about it, when Jesus says, uh, you will be my witnesses in Acts 1.8, it's in Jerusalem, Judea, and the next layer is Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Um, and, and so Samaria is this rim here, and who are the Samaritans? They're people who don't look like you, who don't use maybe even your same language, but they live in your general region or community. So for us, many of those people would be people like people of a different race or culture, or people of a different ethnic um, group. Um, many of the immigrant populations, the Hmong, the French-speaking African Africans who come from places like Congo and Togo and Sierra Leone, of which there's around five to 10,000 in a greater Milwaukee area. Um, the Kareni people um, are some of the ones that I know of that are around. Um, but it's recognizing that they're an object of our witness as well. And, and the question I've always asked uh, every congregation is, what dog do we have in that house? You know, do we have an iron in that fire to use another? You know, to, because I think that as, as a, not only individually, but as a congregation, we ought to be thinking, who's my Jerusalem, who's my Judea, who's my Samaria, who's the ends of the earth? And, and, and are, we, are we focused like Jesus is in uh, carrying those? And I'll just give you one more thing about that. Maybe I've said that here before. One of the things I love about John uh, in these particular chapters is that what Jesus tells us to do to be his witnesses in those areas he already has done John chapter 3 is talking to Nicodemus where is he he's in Jerusalem um, in um, John chapter 3 it's about verse 20 or so um, 22 
After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the countryside. Judean countryside. Now where is he at? He's here. Then he meets the woman in Samaria. He's here. And at the end of chapter 4, it's um, uh, a royal official who comes to ask to have his, uh, uh, his son healed. He's here. In these two chapters, Jesus does exactly what he calls us to do. In these two chapters, he's spoken to somebody from Judea, Jerusalem. He's been in Judea, he's been in Samaria, and he's going to speak to somebody who comes from the ends of the earth. And um, I remember the first time I saw that, I just, wow. Never thought about that before. Mm -hmm. But um, that's what he does. So let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for the gift of this day and the opportunity to be in your word. We thank you um, for uh, blessing us to see the opportunities that we have uh, to walk submitted to your will. And, and Lord, we just ask that as we grow in our life and our discipleship, we might submit more and more so that we might experience your blessings. All the promises you've given us uh, in your word about how it blesses us, not in the future, but even now. And and we uh, thank you, Lord, that you have filled our hearts uh, with uh, reasons to overflow, to allow your spirit to move not only to us, but through us into the lives of others as we share the, the love and grace, the perspective and understanding that uh, we have. We now ask, Lord, that as we prepare to gather to celebrate our thankfulness with you this next week, that you would uh, bless us to count our blessings and then to share those blessings with others uh, what you pour into us that it can be poured into the lives of others uh, in your name in jesus amen amen well have a great uh, week we'll see you in two weeks because uh